But I think actually this is the more important talk. And the reason it's more important is there are many factors that push one towards making a higher RPM or a lower RPM on the VAD. And we really need to fully understand these and take into account each one of these before deciding on a set course. Uh, by the end of this talk, you'll probably have more questions than answers, but we gotta start somewhere. Who knows what this is? Anybody a fan of Greek mythology? I'm sorry? No, but close. Okay, there, there's, there's two evils here. One is on the left called Scylla, and the whirlpool on the right is called Charybdis. I thought this was an appropriate illustration to use for my talk because it sort of illustrates where the talk starts and where it ends. <laughs> the, the basic story in this myth is that Poseidon, the god of the seas, uh, was cheating on his wife, as all those gods did, and he was, Scylla was uh, at that time a beautiful sea nymph. His wife, of course, found out about it and poisoned the water she lived in and turned her into this, whatever, five, six-headed monster. Uh, this monster was reputed to, any, to uh, snatch sailors from their boats as they were crossing through a very narrow strait. This is a strait that existed between Italy and Sicily. And, uh, and so that's Scylla. Charybdis is the whirlpool. Charybdis was one of Poseidon's daughters. And I'm not sure what she did to deserve it or whether it was punishment to Poseidon, but she was turned into a whirlpool. And so it was very difficult for sailors or navigators because you had Scylla and Charybdis on either side of a very bad, narrow area. And it's come to be, uh, to be a metaphor for very treacherous routes that, that there isn't a clear path through. And so how do we negotiate this route? Because I, I firmly believe that titrating LVAD RPMs is akin to trying to negotiate between these two evils. So the, I've broken up the components affected by the VAD RPMs or speed as the LV, the RV, the total effective cardiac output, the pulsatility systemically, whether the aortic valve opens or not, and the LVAD itself. And I'm gonna analyze each of these in turn. The left ventricle. Well, what the LVAD does is it decompresses the left ventricle, that's how it functions. Patient has a very poor LV, the LVAD, drains blood from the left ventricle and pumps most of the blood flow systemically. If the patient has pre-existing MR, usually that gets better. It'll decrease the left atrial pressure and thereby decrease the pulmonary edema and hopefully thereby decrease RV afterload, all right? Because the RV has to be nursed through both perioperatively as well as long-term. Uh, on the left-hand diagram, you see the cannula, and it's sitting opposite the mitral valve, and that's probably a relatively good filling state of the left ventricle. You want to see a more or less neutral position of the septum, perhaps bowing slightly into the right. I apologize for the different orientation, but this is a transthoracic view, and you see the RV up top, and here's a little sliver of the LV and the LVAD RPM is too high relative to the patient's hemodynamics, and you're getting a suction effect and you're pulling the septum over. And we'll get to that in a moment, but the idea is you want to avoid that. And many of us, uh, and particularly in the early years, perioperatively, I used to try to have the lowest RPMs possible, because I did not want this happening in the middle of the night when I wasn't in the hospital uh, to pick it up. And so what I would titrate to is I had my CCO SVO2 swan. If my SVO2 was 65, my continuous cardiac index was above 2.2 or so, I was happy. Whatever got me there, that's the RPM I set it at uh, to give me more of a safety margin with the RPMs. 
as the patient recovered further after surgery, we would titrate it based on echo. And I have changed my philosophy since that period of time, as we'll get to. The right ventricle is obviously a, 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 a natural sequel to what I was just talking about. The RV can fail uh, early after VAD for two reasons. It can be too much RPM or too little. If it's too little, the RV, the RV afterload is still too high and the RV struggles. If the flow is too high on the LV, on the heart me too, it'll return too much blood to the right RVAD, I'm sorry, too much blood to the right ventricle, which it's not used to handling, right? You go in a patient who's used to a cardiac index of 1.7, and you now give them an index of 2.5 or better, the RV may struggle. Your effective cardiac output, I define as the combination of your native cardiac output, that going through your aortic valve, and your LVAD flow. Generally speaking, when you raise the RPM, as we all know, the flow goes up. It's related by a calculation, but effectively there's more blood flow going through the LVAD and less blood flow going through the native heart. Uh, and that's important. Uh, if you go too high on the RPMs, obviously you'll get that septal shift. So again, this balance between too much and too little. Pulsatility. If you lower the RPM, we know that we fill the ventricle more, and the increased LV load usually enhances pulsatility. It'll enhance pulsatility through the pump itself, as the pressure, the relative pressure of the LV and the aorta changes, and also through the aortic valve. More blood flow will flow through the aortic valve. Uh, I, I will tell you that this relationship of increased pulsatility depends heavily on your LV systolic characteristics, meaning, and I'll get back to this again, there's a difference between poor LV function and very, very poor LV function. And there's some patients that the RPMs will be really low and the ventricle is barely doing anything. The LV doesn't contract much at all, there's barely any pulsatility, and it can't open up the aortic valve no matter what you do. All right, and that's an important phenomenon to recognize as you're trying to titrate things. Is pulsatility important for tissue perfusion in the chronic setting? I mentioned this in the prior talk. I don't think it's that important. Acutely it is in the shock patient. Chronically, we have, have accumulating evidence that it's not important. What we do know is that there's increasing evidence that the pulsatility will affect whether AV malformations occur in the GI tract and elsewhere. This, we hypothesized, was related to what we saw with uh, patients in aortic stenosis. Decades ago, it was noticed that patients with very tight aortic stenosis developed AV malformations in their gut. And there are a variety of hypotheses. One of them is that something related to the decreased pulsatility interacts with the endothelium in the GI tract to result in these AV malformations. So in other words, this may be a reason for having your RPMs a little bit lower to enhance your pulsatility. And this is just the, an outline of the causes of GI bleeding. On the right-hand side is the non-pulsatile flow. You have decreased pulse pressure, high flow shear stress, and then angiodysplasia, AV malformations, and angiogenesis. And in combination with the other factors that occur with patients with LVAD, right, they all have acquired von Willebrand's disease, and they all ha are on some degree of anticoagulation, they're prone to bleeding. And it's one of the major reasons for readmission of LVAD patients. And this little red uh, area pointed out by that arrow shows what an AV malformation looks like. It looks pretty innocuous until they start bleeding. In a study by Jabbar et al, they found in a meta-analysis that a higher PI on the LVAD, which is a reflection of the pulsatility, is associated with a lower incidence of GI bleeding. Aortic valve. A lot of literature has been accumulated on the aortic valve. Lack of aortic valve opening is implicated in both root thrombosis as well as the development of aortic insufficiency in LVAD patients. Decreasing the RPM again fills the ventricle, opens the aortic valve. This is a uh, survival curve showing the freedom from at least moderate aortic insufficiency as a reflection of duration of support. And you see here that by about uh, 
two years' time, almost 20% of patients have significant AI. And it's de novo significant AI. This was AI that was not present in the operating room. And this study found that the AI was associated with longer LVAD support and persistent aortic valve closure. The aortic insufficiency is due to a variety of phenomenon, most commonly commissural fusion. Here is what a normal aortic valve looks like in a patient with an LVAD. These were explants at the time of heart transplantation. Here there is some commissural fusion here. Here there are two leaflets with commissural fusion, and here all three. Also you'll see here, it's very hard to appreciate, but multiple fenestrations also develop in the leaflets. So an important reason to keep the RPMs lower. Fill the ventricle, open the aortic valve, hopefully decrease root thrombosis and decrease uh, destruction of the valve. Now to the VAD itself. Higher RPMs leads to higher heat production by the LVAD. That's true for any technology. However, and this is something that I did not know early on, even more important is that the heat dissipation from the pump itself increases as the blood flow passes by it. So although you're producing more heat, the net effect because of the increased blood flow is actually greater washout of heat. And the reason why that's important is heat is a big culprit in the formation of thrombus. So there's reason to think that if you have higher RPMs, there's going to be greater washout and therefore lower thrombus rates. But we don't know that for sure. Not enough data yet. The phenomenon is also occurs when we adjust the RPMs over time, what we do in the early post-op period, what we do in the late post-op period, and what we do once the patient is going home. And all of these are in evolution. Uh, in the trial itself, in the HeartMe2 trial, patients were bridged with heparin and uh, were cubitinized. Uh, in in a subsequent series of patients, it was found that the bleeding rate was too high using that um, regimen, and so many of us abandoned bridging with heparin. And some implicate that as being possibly related to the increased thrombus rate in the pump. So now many centers are resuming the heparin bridging and starting with earlier anticoagulation and using TEG or a similar device to help titrate and individualize the um, coagulo profile of the patient. And then long term, most of the time, we're guided by the morbidities. If the patient's bleeding, we want more pulsatility if they have AV malformations. If thrombosis is the issue, and we've taken care of that, we may want to run higher pump speeds, AI, and so forth. This is just a summary of what I've just been speaking about. So in, in, in the end, there's a yin-yang to pump speed. There's something that exists that's too much, something that exists too little, and we want to go somewhere in between, but what that is is unclear and probably highly individualized. When we do adjust pump speed, we want to do it with echo monitoring to achieve the desired endpoints. And again, remember, there's a difference between poor LV function and very poor LV function. It's nice when you have a patient that's got an underlying EF of 20 as opposed to 5, because they have some contractility and will afford you more pulsatility than the patient with a worse uh, LV function. In my view, the ideal pump speed the LV is moderately decompressed, the RV septum is midline, the pulse pressure is greater than 10, the aortic valve opens every few beats, and the pump flow is as high as possible given the above. This is not published, this is my own philosophy based on the literature that I have seen and my experience. So in conclusion, there is a trade-off to adjusting pump speed. There is much we have yet to learn it seems prudent to closely follow patients until we know more. Each patient has his own idiosyncratic course. Complications may steer us towards higher or lower RPMs, and other adjuncts are important. The PREVENT trial, now being recruited by Thoratec for the HeartMate 2, has certain standardized protocols that they use to see if we can reduce the complication rates that are based on the LVAD RPMs, predominantly related to the pump thrombosis.
So here we have another drawing of the same thing. Do we know who that guy is hanging from the tree? All right, that's Odysseus. If you ever read uh, Odyssey in high school, uh, uh, Odysseus was famed for being able to get past Scylla and Charybdis, and what he did is he steered close to Charybdis and grabbed a branch and got his way through. The reason I say that is it's still quite treacherous. There's no easy, easily navigable area to go, all right? And we're still gonna have a, a lot to learn and discover as we decide what RPM to set the patient at. Uh, the nice thing is we do have other tools, so if the RPMs are a little bit lower and the patient can tolerate it, we may want them to be more anticoagulated and be under additional antithrombotic drugs. But uh, like cylindrical ribdis, it's like being caught between a rock and a hard place. Thanks.